grateful this morning because the Lord's given me this message for you as I preach, not just to you, but to our family who was outside of this, this church, outside these four walls. At my MyGladTidings.org, this message goes out to you too, our extended family, and I hope you are inspired by this message as I preach this message this morning to you and to those who are in this house today. I said, Lord, a few weeks ago I said, just for this Sunday, what do you want me to preach? And Lord always from time to time give me this back to basics sermon. How many know we have to go back to basics sometimes? We got to go back to basics. And actually, it's the, best, the basics is what we need. When the Lord gave the law, and there were all kinds of laws that he gave. And do Numbers, Leviticus, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, the law. When the Lord was given the law and all those intricate laws, the very first law is very basic. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the law. And if you get confused from every other law that I made in the book, go back to the basic. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So if, if, you, if you're just confused on something, what he says, go to God. Make sure we go back to A, the basic. So I'm just preaching a basic sermon today, and you know this story, but this is going to appeal to you and to those who may be watching today. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I'm talking about being a chosen vessel of God. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13, 13 verse 22, and then we're going to be in 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. Being a chosen vessel of God. All of us here are chosen here. Acts 13 and 22 says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Let me read that again. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill my will. And I'm going to read First Samuel a little bit. Dear God, we honor you and thank you for this time. Thank you for your blessings and thank you for your love and grace and mercy. Thank you for this wonderful day that you have made. We're rejoicing and being glad in it. And I thank you for those who are out today in this house and those who may be watching on mygladtidings.org and our, and our internet. Lord, I pray for them. I pray that you bless them and keep them, Father, in your precious name. And Lord, as I preach, I don't preach just to this church, but I preach to the world, Father. And I pray, Father, that you'll give homage, Lord. Give, I give homage to you. I give, give respect to you. I give love to you, Father, for this holy word. I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours, Father. And I thank you in your precious name. Amen. This was a chapter in Acts that was given about David. Now, over 3,000 years ago, God chose a young man named David to be the king of Israel. Out of all the sons of Jesse, the favor of God landed on a kid named David. David was the youngest son of a poor farmer from the small town of Bethlehem. David was a young man who was not even respected by the members of his own family. He was a nobody living in a family of nobodies. Yet, by the grace of God, David became the greatest king in the history of the nation of Israel. He also became the ancestor of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is listed among the great heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. 
And during his life, he received great promises and, 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 and remarkable blessings from the hand of God. I want to spend this time this morning speaking to you about this humble shepherd boy who, who, who became a man after God's own heart. David achieved in this life something that God wants each of his children to achieve. David achieved something that many fall to accomplish, fail to accomplish. Again, David became a man after God's own heart. Now, David was not perfect. In fact, he was far from it. He failed and he failed big. He did the worst things in life imaginable. But he kept short accounts with God. He sinned. But as he was quick, to, but he but he he was quick to confess his sins and display genuine heart repentance. David has much that he can teach us about obedience, faith, and worship of being a chosen vessel of God. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. Read that here. He says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? See, and I rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before you. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Mm -hmm. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, neither has the Lord chosen you. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from the day for it. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. How God chooses vessels. Being a Chosen vessel of God. I want to see how God chooses his vessel. Now, the chapter opens with God reminding Samuel of the fact that he has rejected Saul as king of Israel. Saul was chosen as king because the people wanted to be like other nations around him because the other nations had a king. Up to that point, God had ruled the nation, raising up leaders as they were needed. This was how things happened operated from the time of Moses through the days of the judges. They were warned that elevating a man to the throne would bring political corruption and trouble. When Saul was chosen to be their king, the people were excited and they were thrilled. He was a fine, he was a fine physical specimen of a man, standing head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. He couldn't hide he was so tall and big. 
While he may have been a giant among men, he was a spiritual dwarf. Saul was a jealous man who lived for the praises of the people. He often overstepped his boundaries and was guilty of dreadful disobedience to God and to the commands of the Lord. And as a result of this, the Lord proved to Israel the dangers of a human king and God rejected Saul as king of his people. As a result of Saul's rebellion, God chooses a new king to rule over Israel. He chooses a young man named David. When God chooses David, he chooses an unlikely candidate for such a grand and powerful position. The king and the champion of Israel. And in God's choice, David as king, we're allowed to see something of the processes that God uses when he would choose someone to work for him. Today I want to preach on how God chooses. And it may be that he has his hand on someone in this very room or someone watching this broadcast. I know he is looking for such people this morning. So let's notice the teachings here of this passage. Being a vessel of God. How God is choosing. First of all, let me start with this. He chooses, his choices are sovereign. Verse 1 again says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Remember, he says, I provided myself. See, his choices involve sovereign providence or wisdom or foresight. It is against the background of rebellion and rejection that God begins the processes of choosing a new king of Israel. He was ready to raise up a new king and the people had been made ready to accept a new king. God worked behind the scenes during those difficult days of Israel's history Mm -hmm. to prepare the way of his plan, his plan to be fulfilled. Now, his choice also involves sovereign planning. Next, here's next. They're going play by play here. Next, Samuel is told where to go to find the king. It appears that the Lord had been arranging everything to bring the chosen king into the world precisely at the right moment in history. It, if you look back at the ancestry of David, you will find the hand of the Lord moving and shaping events in time. One of David's ancestors was a woman named Rahab. Rahab is the one who hid the spies when they spied off the land of Canaan. She had been saved out of a pagan idolatry and brought into the nation of Israel. She married a man named Salmon and became the mother of a man named Boaz. Boaz also married a Gentile girl named Ruth who was brought out of paganism with the sovereign grace of the Lord. Ruth and Boaz were the great-grandparents of the boy named David. These events were not accidental. They were part of a perfect plan created and planned in the span of time that culminated up to the event in this history up to now. This was not an accident or by chance. It was the mighty hand of the Lord. This was the Lord's plan. He has a plan for each and every one of us. As he chose us, he has a plan for each and every one of you. His choice involves sovereign power. I want to read verse 1 again. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from, reject and, and from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Notice the words again. 
I have. He says, I have. Many people have great plans and dreams, but they lack the power to bring them to pass. Not the Lord. What he proposes, he is well able to execute it and make it happen. He says, I have. Now, there's some lessons here. First, I just want to remind you that there are no accidents in life. Everything that occurs is part of a larger plan. God is working often behind the scenes in ways that we cannot even comprehend to accomplish his plans and his purposes. As in Romans 8, 28, he says, We know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Thank God for the truth that God is in absolute control. Who knows that today? Secondly, God is well able to bring his plan to pass. He will never propose a plan that he is not able to accomplish. That is our God. Whether it's a plan to raise up a shepherd boy to make him a king, or whether it's a plan to, to work out his will in our lives. He is well able to see it through. Yes, he is. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Thirdly, God's sovereign choices extend to every area of life. You know what? I don't understand it all, but I believe the Bible teaches us that God is in the business of working all things according to his perfect will. And bringing his internal uh, purposes to pass in time. Isaiah 46, 10 through 11 says this. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will also do it. See, see, some people, I don't understand people in this house, but some people are bothered by the concept or the idea that God is in absolute control of their life. I'm glad he's in control of my life. Anybody, anybody upset about that? If you raise your hand, I'm going to to pray for you. I'm going to stop this and pray for you right now. I'm glad that he's in total control of our lives. I and we, however, should find it comforting that's happening here. I know that nothing can happen unless the Father ordains it. And that if he ordains it, it is for our good and for his glory. Thank God for his sovereign and life-changing choices. Now, let's get to the meat of the story here, too. I'm going to read verses 6 through 10, but I'm, 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 I'm gonna, we're going go, to go through this together. Now, here's the meat of the story. Samuel here, from here on out, is sent to Bethlehem to anoint the king, the new king. And when Samuel arrives there, he commands Jesse to gather together his sons. They come before Samuel and pass before him one by one. It is in this process that God makes known his choice for the king. But his his choices, while they are sovereign, also carry with them some real surprises here. Let me read verse 6 through 10. It says here, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance of his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see his as man sees. For looks at the outward appearance. Man looks for the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, 
the Lord has not chosen these. The first of Jesse's sons passes before Samuel. Here you go. His name is Eliab. His name means God is father. He is the physical, he is a fine physical young man, and, and Samuel thinks he is surely the chosen one. But God says, I have refused him. The word refuse simply means to reject. Eliab may, might, might look good on the outside, but something in his character on the inside disqualified him from being the king. Then he calls Abinadab next. His name means my father is noble. But he's, he, too, he passes over to him and he's rejected by the Lord. Next is Shama. His name means astonishment. This may refer to his physical size or some other physical trait, but no matter what, he is rejected also. Then one another, one another, they keep coming, one after another. They keep coming in front of Jesse, in front of Jesse and, and before Saul until seven have passed by and are rejected by the Lord. Surely these men are fine physical men and, and great and strong. They look good and refined and, and toned by hours of hard physical labor. Remember, Saul had the same traits. Any one of them would have possessed the physical requirements to turn heads and rule as the king. But none of them, here's the key, none of them possess the right kind of character traits on the inside to be the king. I want you to know, have, know something here. God sees what man cannot see. Even Samuel was impressed with Eliab. But God wasn't. And you would have thought that Samuel would have learned his lesson with Saul. But how many know sometimes we, the eye is appealing than what we think? See, Samuel was still looking at men through human eyes, even though he was a great man of God, even though he had the Lord's spirit in him, even though he was a prophet, he was still looking through human eyes. We're all human. We do the same thing. I've seen it before. You know, uh, when I was young, I've seen it before. We see a young man, he's handsome, he's maybe good looking, well spoken, intelligent. We look at him and we say, that young man should make a fine preacher someday. The problem is, we cannot see his heart. We see a man, he's saved, he's good to his family, been blessed in his work, and has some business sense. And we look at him and say, that man would make a good administrator also to a good pastor. Again, we can't see his heart. We judge people by how they strike the eye. God judges them on a far different level, folks. He, he, he judges us by a far different level, that level we cannot comprehend. See, that person we think that can do great things in the church may not even make a blip on God's radar score, radar, on his radar screen. He may not. She may not. Oh, I'm just telling the truth, folks. Can I, can, I, can I preach the truth? You mind if I preach the truth today? While that one person we think will be a mount, but, but while that one person we think that may not mount to nothing might just be used in a mighty way by the Lord. Amen. You see, God makes, <laughs> he makes his choices based on not what he sees about our outward characteristics, but on what he sees within the contents of our hearts. And see, his choice is also surprising in requirements. See, God tells Samuel that he does not look at the physical, physical attributes of a man. God looks at the character of a man's heart. Long before Saul ever stopped reigning as king of Israel, God had already determined to raise up a man in the right kind of heart. You see, as the sons of Jesse stand there that day, they all looked apart. But Samuel could not see was the condition of their hearts. Eliab, let's go back to him for it. He was the very first one. 
Maybe the oldest here. For instance, he caught Samuel's eye, but he reveals the character of his heart in the next chapter. See, there we see that Ib Eliab, what he is, he's critical, he's jealous, and he's negative. This is the time when the, the, they had the battle against the Philistines and on side of David's battle with Goliath. In the next chapter, it says, 1 Samuel 17, 28, it says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. See, see, one thing, he may have been a big man on the outside, but he was a baby and immature on the inside. He was not the kind of man God could raise or use for his glory. This is a lesson for us here. Church, we need to learn this lesson. When we look for leaders, we often seek those who possess certain characteristics that we think bring success and ability. We look for people of influence. And if you're watching today, I want you to listen to this here. We look for people of influence and intelligence and means. God, however, looks for people of integrity and character. He wants people who are faithful and holy. I believe we have some people like that here in this church. We do. And what a difference. God is not nearly as impressed with people's achievements as we are. He is not concerned about the beauty of the outward man or woman. He is caught up in the condition of the heart. As God looks at your life, what does he see? Ask, that, ask yourself that. As God looks at your life, as he looks at your heart, what does he see? Does he see a handsome or a pretty face or a pleasing physical appearance and a well-kept, well-dressed body? No, he doesn't see that. He sees your heart. He sees the real you. He sees what's on the inside. But here's the real question. Does God see a heart that he can use? Or does he say about your life the same thing he said about Eliab? I have refused him. What does God see in your heart today? And you know, and by the way, thank you, Lord. You know, we often judge people by what we are of what they are and what they are and what we are. We, we, we judge people by what they are. God, on the other hand, looks at what they can become. Please get that. We judge people by what they are, but God looks at what they can become. Thank you, Lord. Thank God... He judges us on the basis of amazing grace. <laughs> Not what the eye can see. Thank you, Lord. And then his choice is surprising in his receptions. Verses 11, 13, let me read that for you. He says, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep and the Samuel, and said, Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he went and brought him in, brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of all to the horn of oil. And anointed him in the midst of the brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day. From that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Ramah. And if you recall. When Saul sinned. The spirit of the Lord left him. And an evil spirit came upon him. All the time. In this instant. 
the Spirit of the Lord came upon David and anointed David at this time from this time forth. After seven sons have, have passed, before Samuel, all have been rejected. Samuel finds out that there is another son. He is the youngest and he is said to be with the sheep. See, here, here's what's significant about this. He is, it is so significant within the family that he's not even summoned with the rest of the boys. But he is left out there. He was left out of the feast and the sacrifice. He is out there doing the job of a humble servant. In fact, and what makes this significant is when he is mentioned by his father, he is even called, he is not even called by his name. He is simply called the youngest. He didn't say, oh, there's David, my other son. He says, the youngest is out there. And when he walks in, Samuel sees a ruddy guy. What ruddy means? He rosy cheeks, he's healthy looking. With bright eyes and a, and a, and a, and a good looking, he's a good looking young man. And God tells Samuel to anoint this one for this is him. The one rejected and passed over by the others is the very one picked by the Lord. No doubt Jesse and his sons were all amazed as they watched Samuel walk over to young David and pour the oil on his head. Again here, we must be careful how we measure or judge those around us. We look at people today and think we know who God will use and what he will do with them. Family, let me tell you something here. If you're watching today, you never know. You know, God often passes over the ones <laughs> I want to say this nicely. God often passes over the ones others would choose and calls those we would never have imagined. See, God excels in taking nobodies and making them somebodies. When God went after a man after his own heart, he did not go to the palaces. He didn't go to the temples or to the places, to the high places. He didn't go to Harvard. He didn't go to Yale. He didn't go to other places of influence. He didn't go to wealth and power. God chose the most unlikely person in the most unlikely places. The key to being used of him is possessing the right kind of heart. You know what? You never know what God will do with unknown people around you this morning. If you're watching today, you never know what the Lord can do with you. No one but God would have picked Saul of Tarsus to be the apostle of the Gentiles, who became Paul, one of the greatest preachers, look, one of our greatest book writers and orators of all time. But God chose him. Who would have thought that Peter would have been used like he was by the Lord after the way he fell? Who would have thought that the Lord would use a man like Gideon after he doubted his own ability to lead an army? Who would have thought that he would have chosen you for this time? Who would have thought it? And his, his choices were specific or exact. God's choices are. And it seems plainly clear here that God had a specific plan in mind. He sent Samuel to a specific town, to a specific family, and to a place, and, and to a specific country, and then to the specific person he had chosen to be the next king. Here are some signs as why God made the choice he did in his life. God chooses those who are ready. Now let me read verse 11 and 12. I want you to really get this. And Samuel said to Jesse, are the, all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down till he comes. So he went and brought him in. 
Now he was ruddy and bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. See, it, it, when Jesse and David's brothers are brought in before Samuel, they are sanctified. This was in verse 5. In other words, their sins are dealt with and they are made ready for worship. When David is brought in, <coughs> there is no time for him to be sanctified. But he is ready nonetheless. David is a picture of that believer who keeps his heart and mind in a state of readiness. He does not know when the Lord might call him, so he stays ready at all times. That's the kind of person God is looking for today as well. God does not use dirty vessels, but he uses those which are clean and ready for his call. And then God chooses those who are reliable. When God calls David, he finds him faithfully doing what he has been told to do. He is keeping the sheep. He is doing a dirty, lonely job, but he does it because it's what he has been assigned to do. After he's anointed, what does he do? He goes back to the flock. He knows he's in the, he, and David really, I think he, he, he knows what he's doing. He knows what happened, but I don't think he does. He just does what he needs to do. He got the oil. He maybe wiped a little oil off, and then he goes back. I need to take care of my sheep. That's what he does. That's what he does. He's doing a dirty job, but that's what he's trying to do. He goes back to the sheep. Why? Because that is what he does. Even later on, after he is called to Jerusalem to play for King Saul later on, he returned to his father's sheep. Why? Because that's what he does. David was given an assignment and he carried it out faithfully. He even placed his life on the line to protect those sheep. And when Jesse looked at David, he saw the youngest of his sons. His brothers saw a little brat. Samuel saw like a cute little kid there. But when God looked at David, he saw integrity. He saw faithfulness. He saw responsibility and he saw character. Others saw a nobody. But God saw a king. And he sees you too. Family, if you want to be used by the Lord, let, him encourage, let me encourage you to be faithful where you are. I said, Lord, thank you. The best thing you can do is grow where you're planted. You know, that's hard for some people. And I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me that. Grow where you are planted. Allow God to develop your character and your integrity, your faithfulness and your sense of responsibility in the ordinary routine events of life and other things. Be ready to be reliable, for you never know when the call of God will come. He knows where you are. He knows how to find you. He knows how and when to open up all the right doors in our lives. Just be faithful and walk with them. I've been praying about that. I ask, Lord, bless me to be faithful and walk with me. I'll walk with you. And in his time, he will use you for his glory. See, he's already using some people in this church. To make the church run the way it should, inside and outside of this church. Then God chooses those who are redeemed. Let me read verse 13. I'm almost done. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose. And went to Ramah. When Samuel anointed David and, and perhaps whispered God's plan in his ear, this is not what David's this was not David's first encounter with God. See, no doubt David 
had seen the glory of God when the heavens, when he, in the power of that was messing in, in the universe in Psalms 19. David had witnessed God's tender care in his people and his own relationship with this flocks. That's evident in Psalms 23. And others which reveal the heart of David while he was a still young shepherd. He might have walked into public stage in 1 Samuel chapter 16. But David had been walking with the Lord for quite a long time. <laughs> Listen, David's own testimony as he was talking to King Saul in 1 Samuel 17 and 37 in the fight with Goliath. He said, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Meaning some time back he had to fight to keep his sheep safe. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then in verse 45 at the fight, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with the sword. You come to me with the spear. With the javelin. But I come to you. <laughs> I come to you. I'm bringing big brother with me. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel. Whom you have defied. Now here's the point here. God calls those who know him. He chooses his vessels from among his redeemed ones. And those who know him in faith relationship with him, who live clean lives, who are ready, who are reliable and available, those are candidates to be used by the Lord. Does this describe you today? As I conclude here, God is still looking for people he can call and use for his glory. I, I always want to be used for the Lord's glory, and I hope you do too. Can, can you honestly, if you're watching today, can you honestly say that your life is ready and available? Do you possess the kind of character God is looking for? If you're watching today and you're in this house and you know that there are problems in your walk with the Lord, I invite you to come to him this morning. He is willing and ready to come into your life and make it new today. He wants to use each of us for his glory. But he wants to make sure that your heart is right. Let's be ready to be used to the Lord if he needs us. We need to meet him now because we don't want to meet him later. In this house, who loves Jesus? Who is saved today? Raise your hand. Pray, put them down. If you want to be used of the Lord for his glory, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Praise God. I want to pray for those who are listening today who may not know Jesus, who need Jesus. And if you're watching today, just let you know you need to meet him now because you don't want to meet him later. He wants to use you for his glory. He wants to meet, use him for his honor. And he wants to know. He wants to ask you a question today. Are you saved? If not, dear God, our Lord says, I want him ready to come in to your heart today. Bow your heads with me. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and coming back for me. Thank you for your grace and mercy and your compassion that you're showing me now. You're giving me a chance to get saved. You give me a chance to change my life. And I thank you for right now, I want to change my life for the better. Save me, Father. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creature. I want to be made whole. And I want to be used by you. And I thank you, Father. Forgive me of my sins and my shame. Make me a new creature. Make me whole. 
I want to be your child. Give me a new walk and a new talk because I want to serve you and be your child. Now, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Now I'm saved. Now I'm free. Now I'm redeemed. And I am your child. Amen. Give God a hand praise today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.